Howdy. My name is Daryl Wahlberg. I am a practicing Jehovah's Witness in good standing, contrary to the misdirection of the apostates. Today we're going to discuss why Je was Jesus being rude to his mother at the wedding feast at Cana? John 2, 4. And why is Satan called the one having the means to cause death at Hebrews 2.14? These are interesting questions. And what's it we get right into it? Because we need to have an answer for these questions. Shortly after his baptism, Jesus and his disciples were invited, invited to a marriage feast in Cana. His mother was also there. When the wine ran a little short, Mary told Jesus, they have no wine. In response, Jesus said to his mother, what have I to do with you, woman? My hour has not yet come. John 2, 1 through 4. Now today, for someone to just read over that and to address his mother as a woman, and to say to her, what have I to do with you, would likely be considered disrespectful, even insulting. You might get slapped by your father if you were to say that to your mother. But to lay such charges against Jesus would be to ignore the cultural and the linguistic context of the event. An understanding of these usage of the usages or the usage of these expressions in Bible times would be most helpful. Regarding the term woman, Vine's expository dictionary of Old and New Testament words notes, used in addressing a woman, it is a term not of reproof or severity, but endearment or respect. Other sources agree with this. For example, the Anchor Bible states, this is not a rebuke, nor an impolite term, nor an indication of a lack of affection. It was Jesus' normal, polite way of addressing women. The New International Dictionary of the New Testament Theology explains that the word is used as an address with no irreverent secondary meaning. Gerhard Kittel's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says that such usage is in no way disrespectful or derogatory. Thus, we should not conclude that Jesus was being rude to or unkind to his mother in addressing her by the term woman. Matthew 15, 28, Luke 13, 12, John 4, 21, 19, 26, 20, 13, and 15. What about the expression, what have I to do with you? Uh, this is apparently a common Jewish idiom that appears a number of times in the Bible. In both the Old Testament and New Testament, as you consider them. We call them the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, the Hebrew and Aramaic Scriptures, and the Christian Greek Scriptures. For example, in 2 Samuel 16.10, we find David stopping Abishai from killing Shimei, Shemi, uh, by saying, what do I have to do with you men, you sons of uh, Zeruiah? Thus let him call down evil, because Jehovah himself has said to him, call down evil upon David. Uh, likewise, we read at 1 Kings 17, 18, that the widow of Zerapheth, upon finding that her son had died, said to Elijah, what do I have to do with you, O man of the true God? You have come to put me to bring you have come to me to bring my error to mind and to put my son to death. From these Bible examples, we can see that the expression, what have I to do with you, is often used not to show disdain, disdain or arrogance, but to refuse involvement in some pr proposed or suggested action or to express a difference in viewpoint or opinion. What then can be said about Jesus' words to Mary? his mother. When Mary told Jesus, they have no wine, 
she was evidently not simply informing Jesus of the fact, but suggesting that he do something about it. Mary obviously knew Jesus' power. Jesus used that common idiom to turn down Mary's subtle suggestion and his added words, My hour has not yet come. Help us to see the reason for his doing so. From the time of his baptism and anointing in 29 CE, Jesus was keenly aware that it was Jehovah's will for him as the promised Messiah to follow a course of integrity that would culminate in his death, his resurrection, and his glorification. Death, resurrection, and glorification. The Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and give his soul a ransom in exchange for many. Matthew 20, 28. As the time for his death neared, Jesus made this clear by saying, The hour has come. John 12, 1. John 12, 23. John 13, 1. Thus, in his prayer on the night before his death, Jesus said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. John 17, verse 1. And finally, when the mob arrived to arrest him in Gethsemane, Jesus roused the apostles from sleep and said, The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is being betrayed to the hands of sinners. Mark 14, 41. At the wedding in Cana, however, Jesus had just embarked on his ministry as the Messiah, and his hour had not yet come. His primary objective was to do his Father's will. In a way, and at the time, that his Father directed, and no one could interfere with his determined course. In conveying this to his mother, Jesus was firm, but in no way disrespectful or unkind. Mary, in turn, did not feel embarrassed or insulted by her son. In fact, sensing Jesus' meaning, Mary told those ministering at the wedding, whatever he tells you, do it. Rather than ignoring his mother, Jesus performed his first recorded miracle as the Messiah. We don't know if there were any other miracles, but they're not recorded before that. So it appears to be his first recorded miracle. Turning water into not just wine, but probably the best wine ever produced in the world. Thus demonstrating a fine balance in doing his father's will and acknowledging his mother's concern. John 2, 5 through 11. At Hebrews, second question, at Hebrews 2.14, why is Satan called the one having the means to cause death? In brief, Paul meant that Satan personally or through his agents can cause the physical death of humans. In harmony with that fact, Jesus called Satan a manslayer when he began, John 8.44. Misunderstanding may arise over Hebrew Hebrews 2.14, because of the way some translations render it, saying that Satan has the power of death, or the power over death, King James Version, Revised Standard Version, New International Version, Jerusalem Bible. Such renderings could make it appear that Satan has unlimited ability to kill anyone he chooses. However, that is clearly not the case. If it were, he would very likely have wiped Jehovah's worshipers off the face of the earth a long time ago. The Greek word, its expression rendered power over death in some translations and means to cause death in the New World Translation is kratos to uh, thaneto. To thaneto is from the expression meaning death. Kratos basically means force, strength, or might. According to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, 
It denotes the presence and significance of force or strength rather than its exercise. Hence, in Hebrews 2.14, Paul does not imply that Satan has the ultimate power over death. Rather, he is pointing to Satan's ability or potential to cause death. And let me give you an example. Somebody brings over some alcohol or drugs. Oh, come on. It's nothing. It's harmless. And you do it, you OD. Or you die of alcohol poisoning. See, it's the person that caused it, but who put the person up? Who put you up to improving? See, Satan has the potential to cause death in that aspect. Now, how does Satan exercise the means to cause death? Well, in the book of Job, we read of one instance that may be somewhat exceptional. And the account says that Satan used a storm to cause the death of Job's children. Notice, though, that Satan could do this only with God's permission, which was given because a vital issue was being decided. God actually gave Job the permission to kill, I mean, uh, Satan the permission to kill Job's children, but not Job or his wife. Job 1.12, 18, and 19. Indeed, Satan was not able to kill Job himself. Permission for that was withheld. Job 2.6 This shows that even though on occasion Satan has been able to cause the death of faithful humans, we need not fear that he can snuff out our lives at will. In fact, Satan really doesn't want to kill the believers of Jehovah. He would rather uh, deceive them into forsaking Jehovah. He would rather cause us all to, like you apostates and disassociated and inactive ones and you left ones, he wants you to leave Jehovah. If he kills you, you're coming back in the uh, resurrection. He's got no power over you no more. He's got no authority to persuade you anymore. You see, Satan has also caused death through human agents. Thus, many Christians have died for their faith, like the one who entices you to take drugs. You're a friend, supposedly. Believe me, they're no friend of yours. Some being murdered by enraged mobs or unjustly executed on the orders of government officials or corrupt judges, Revelation 2.13. Jesus was executed at the orders of a government official who was corrupt. Satan has sometimes caused death by playing on human weaknesses. And back in the days of Israel, the prophet Balaam counseled the Moabites to entice the Israelites to commit unfaithfulness toward Jehovah. Numbers 31.16 And believe it or not, that resulted in the death of more than 23,000 Israelites. Numbers 25, 9, 1 Corinthians 10, 8. Today, some likewise fall for Satan's machinations and are lured into immorality or other ungodly practices. Sex before marriage, boom, you end up with AIDS or HIV. You end up with hepatitis. It's a sin against your own body. True, such ones usually do not immediately lose their lives, but they do risk losing out on everlasting life. And in that way, Satan causes their death, like you apostates, you DF, you disassociate, and even some of you inactive ones. Satan can cause your death because he draws you away from Jehovah. He keeps you from committing to the being the slave of Jehovah. Even though we all recognize Satan's potential to cause harm, we need not fear him unduly. When Paul said that Satan had the means to cause death, he also said that Christ died in order that he might bring Satan to nothing and that he might emancipate, or emancipate all those who for the fear of death were subject to slavery all through their lives, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Yes, that Jesus paid the ransom and thus freed believing mankind, not you unbelievers, believing mankind from slavery to death. 
to sin and death, 2 Timothy 1.10. Of course, it is sobering to think that Satan has the means to cause death. But we are confident that Jehovah can undo any harm caused by Satan and his agents. Jehovah assures us that the resurrected Jesus will break up the works of the devil, 1 John 3, 8. In Jehovah's power, Jesus will resurrect the dead and thus nullify death itself, John 5, 28 and 29. Eventually, Jesus will dramatically expose the limits of Satan's power by abyssing him. Satan will be finally consigned to everlasting destruction. Revelation 20, 1 through 10. That's the hope. No more Satan, no more evil. And that day is going to come. The question is, are you going to be there for it? Some of you apostates still have that opportunity. The light's on and the door is open. If you haven't committed blasphemy, you're going to be allowed in. If you have, you're in the walking dead. You're never going to be anything. You're having your existence in full right now. Whatever it is you do, you might as well do it to the best of your power because you're not making it into that new system of things. See, there's no forgiveness for blasphemy. Nighttime, nightmare theater, you're a blasphemer. You mock Jehovah God. And you're stuck on stupid and I can't fix stupid. Marcia, the hooligan, the smurf idiot. You blasphemers. You blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. You're stuck on stupid. All of you. Vander puke. <laughs> Bobby in the Chomo, child molester. Goathead, <laughs> all of you. The rest of you still got time to come back. JW.org, publications, books, and brochures. Return to Jehovah. Come on back, the lights on, the doors open. Thanks for watching this video on have a nice day.